Barbara McClintock was born on June 16, 1902 in Hartford, Connecticut, one of four children of Thomas Henry McClintock and Sarah Handy McClintock. She was christened Elena McClintock, but her parents soon started calling her Barbara. They considered this name a perfect match for her forthright, no-nonsense character. They had come to believe that Elena was too feminine and a gentle name for their daughter. Her father, Thomas Henry McClintock, was a family doctor whose parents had come to America from Britain. Her mother, Sarah Handy, came from an upper-class Boston family. She was a housewife, poet, and artist. From the start, Barbara and her mother got on rather badly. Between the ages of three and five, to help reduce the stress on her mother, Barbara spent most of her time living with her aunt and uncle in Massachusetts. Barbara returned to her parents in Hartford to begin school. In 1908, the whole family moved to Brooklyn, New York. In contrast to her shaky relationship with her mother, Barbara bonded with her father. Both parents did everything they could to allow Barbara to grow into the person she wanted to be, even allowing her to skip school if she had other plans. From an early age, being the person she wanted to be meant being alone. Barbara preferred her own company to anyone else. Mark Lintuck was an active child and enjoyed many sports like volleyball, skating, and swimming. She had a passion for information and in a time when a woman's career was a successful marriage, McClintock was determined to go to college. At Brooklyn's Aramus Hall High School, her teachers could see that Barbara was exceptionally clever and perhaps destined for life as a college professor. Her mother was very uncomfortable about this, believing that female college professors were bizarre creatures. She refused to allow Barbara to go to college believing it will turn Barbara into an oddball nobody would ever want to marry. Eventually, in September 1919, Barbara's father overcame her mother's objections, and age 17, Barbara rushed off to enroll at Cornell University, Itachin, New York. Living home was a liberating experience for Barbara. She grew happier, more relaxed, and enjoyed her time as an undergraduate. Her intense desire to be alone also faded. She socialized with other students, joined a jazz band, and was elected president of the women's freshman class. Barbara McClintock took her first genetic course in 1921. Her ability in this field soon caught the attention of her teacher, Claude Hutchinson, who recommended that she should jump straight onto the graduate-level course the following year. She was delighted to do this, all the time growing ever more fascinated by the genetics of plants. After receiving a B.S. in agriculture in 1923, she decided to pursue her fascination at graduate school. In 1925, McClintock was awarded an MS in Botany and in 1927, a PhD in Botany, both earned at Carnell. Her MS and PhD degrees involved investigation of plants' genetics. This will be the focus of her research for more or less the rest of her life. After she completed her PhD, Carnell appointed McClintock to the role of instructor in the Botany department. McClintock worked in plant cytogenetics, meaning she used microscopes to investigate plant genetics at the cellular level, particularly studying chromosomes, the chunks of genetic codes sitting inside cells. Cytogenics had begun to reveal more of the secrets of life than traditional style genetics could. In addition to her own individual research work and her teaching load, McClintock began guiding Harriet B. Crinton, a graduate student. In 1931, the pair published a major discovery. McClintock and Creighton had been researching the behavior of chromosomes. McClintock developed improved staining techniques which allowed her to see chromosomes under the microscope better than anyone else had before. Using the staining techniques, McClintock and Creighton proved the existence of chromosomal crossover. Chromosomal crossover had been proposed as a theory 20 years earlier by Thomas Morgan to account for the way offsprings inherit genes from their parents. McClintock and Creighton proved the theory was correct. In 1936, age 34, McClintock became an assistant professor at the University of Missouri, where she worked until 1941. A few years earlier, in the summers of 1931 and 1932, McClintock had visited Missouri and learned how to use X-rays to cause mutations in cells. When she returned in 1936, she began using X-rays again. She discovered that large-scale mutations can arise from breaking, fusion, and bridging of chromosomes. In 1938, McClintock analyzed the cell genetics of the chromosome centromere, for the first time describing how it functions. 
Her time at the University of Missouri was relatively unhappy. Although she could be rather abrasive and intimidating herself, at Missouri she came up against the even more abrasive and intimidating Mary Guthrie, another assistant professor who also worked in cytology. McClintock and Guthrie got on exceptionally bad, making McClintock's life miserable all too frequently. She also incorrectly saw no prospects of ever getting a secured, tenured position at Missouri. She decided it was time to move on. In early 1941, aged 38, McClintock became a visiting professor at Columbia University in New York. In 1942, she accepted a temporary genetic position at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory on Long Island. Within a year, she had been offered and accepted a permanent faculty position. She was very pleased with her new role. She no longer had teaching duties and she had freedom to do whatever research she liked. She worked at Cold Spring Harbor for the rest of her career. In 1944, she became the third woman ever to be elected to America's National Academy of Sciences. Beginning in 1944, McClintock studied the relationship between color patterns on corn plants and the look of their chromosomes. One of the colors she was most interested in was purple. She wanted to understand the genetic reasons for purple-spotted corn. She discovered parts of the chromosome, she called them the dissociators and activators that could cause insertions, deletions and relocations of genes in the chromosomes. In 1948, she discovered that dissociators and activators could transpose. In other words, jump to different places on the chromosomes. They are often therefore called transposable elements. McClintock produced a theory that the dissociators and activators were in fact gene controllers. She called them controlling elements. They control the genes on a chromosome. They could inhibit or modify their behavior. This explained why an individual living thing, such as a person, can produce all sorts of different cells even though every cell has the same genetic code. McClintock presented her work in 1951 to an audience of key players from America's universities at Cold Spring Harbor's annual summer symposium. She focused on her theory of controlling elements as gene regulators. She was dismayed by the reaction. Other scientists could not follow her line of thought. Although she had won plenty of recognition for her previous work, McClintock regarded her work on mobile genetic elements as the most important work by far. Yet, nobody seemed to be taking any notice of it. Feeling ignored, she became depressed and she stopped publishing her work in this field. At the beginning of the 1970s, molecular biologists discovered transposition taking place in bacteria and viruses. They began to see that transposition was important in immunology and cancers. Scientists also saw the potential importance of transposition in manipulating genes to function in the way scientists wanted them to. Genetic engineering Today, we know that 50% of the human genome is made up of transposable elements. In May 1971, McClintock received the National Medal of Science from President Richard Nixon. A large number of other awards and honorary degrees followed, culminating in the 1983 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for her discovery of mobile genetic elements. She was by this time 81 years old. McClintock never made close friends. She regarded herself as a free spirit. Coming too close to anyone might have robbed her of some of that precious freedom. She enjoyed her privacy, did not marry, and had no children. Barbara McClintock died at the age of 90 of natural causes in Huntington, New York on September 2, 1992. She died peacefully. Her mind remained clear and intellectually vigorous to the end. She was buried in the Huntington Rural Cemetery. Thank you very much for watching our videos. We'll like to give you another interesting video for you to enjoy next. But before then, our team will be very happy if you can like this video and share it with your friends on social media. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss other interesting videos like this. Look at your screen now to see two other videos we handpicked for you to enjoy next. We love you.